Okay, so uh, let's talk about kind of how we use these different types of spectra in astronomy. Um, and so, I'll get on the way here in the diagram. So imagine that first of all you have some star, and that star, I need to add a third observer actually, I'll come back to that. But that star we can, we can assume to be emitting what the type of light that the stars typically do. And now there's some gas cloud hanging out, we'll say light years away, you know, just a very long distance, I've just had to scale it down here. But there's some gas cloud just hanging out in the universe that would otherwise, in the absence of that star, that gas cloud would just be sitting there completely frozen. Uh, now, it's, it's still, we call it a gas, but it's basically at temperature near absolute zero. But when we bring that star nearby, all of a sudden, what's going to happen is that star is going to heat up that cloud. And so I want to consider what will happen if we, are, if we are an observer at, for example, over here. And in this case here, what we would be seeing is we'd be looking at that gas cloud that is kind of, you know, maybe partially blocking our view of that star. And then now, if we were some other observer, let's consider what they would see if they're simply just looking right up that gas cloud where that star is completely out of view. And then I'm going to add one more observer, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, actually, let's do that right now. We'll call it observer A, which I'm going to draw here. Um, I'll do observers in green. So observer A, we'll say, is right here. This is the third other us or whatever. Um, now, specifically what I want to note here is when this observer looks up at the sun, up directly at that star, what spectrum do they see? And observer A will report that the spectrum that's directly coming out of this cloud, out of our sun, I should say, the intensity versus wavelength, they're going to report that for all practical purposes, that star is emitting a continuous thermal spectrum or a black body spectrum. And they can directly measure, based on that peak wavelength, they can measure the temperature of the star. And that's what you can find when you're looking at unobstructed views of the star. So, observer A is going to look up there, and without anything in the way, that's the spectrum that they're going to see. Now let's consider what observer B would see here. So here, I'll redraw that. There's observer B, and we'll draw their spectrum when they look in the direction of the sun. Again, we're going to have wavelength and intensity. And now let's just, let's consider what's going to happen with the light. Um, actually, let, let's, let's write what they see first, and then we'll try to figure out why. So if you were that observer, what I'm going to tell you is your observation would be, uh, I need to do that in darker. Your observation will be the following. You're going to see more or less what that star had originally looked like to observer A down there, except you're going to see this. Something like that. And I, I kind of hope you see what I'm drawing. So this is the spectrum that B observes. And then let's draw what observer C would see down here. So specifically when person B looks straight towards that gas cloud, and when person C looks straight towards that gas cloud. What they're going to see here, and this is for C, is actually going to be the one that's going to be the most markedly different than the other two that we just saw. So um, let me, and I'm going to redraw this just slightly. Well, actually, no. I'll leave it as such for now. Same axes. And what they're going to see is going to look like this. They're going to see, instead of a, an absorption spectrum here, they are going to look up at that gas cloud, and what they're going to see is nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Beep. Boop. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> uh, the sound effects are required to draw that. So, uh, in that case there, they've seen a very different type of spectrum than either of those first two people. And now, again, it's important to remember that each of these two are looking at the same thing, except from a very different kind of perspective relative to the star there. So think about why specifically it would be that person C sees this and person B sees that.
And to give a hint here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click and drag this top one over to be perfectly on top of this. And I will, I'll do the top one in green. I'll redraw this one in green here. <laughs> Whatever color this is, <laughs> not green. <laughs> uh, here. I think that's all color coded properly now. So um, let's explain exactly why this happens. And now that I have kind of moved this diagram for directly on top, let's point something out very, exp uh, very expressly. That person, for person B very clearly sees what we're going to call an emission. Nope, uh, uh, an absorption spectrum. Person C very clearly sees what we call an emission spectrum. Now, if they had the different de the, the other depiction where we graph the intensity of light just by, by showing the color and how bright it is, which, by the way, that's not always the best because for people who are colorblind, they can't see the differences in color across the row. That's one reason that, pedagogically, it's a little bit preferred not to use that. But if you were to, like, see that, Again, what this person would see would just be a couple of different, very, very specific colors based on each of these peaks here. And so to be very clear, when this person sees a doublet down there and that person sees a doublet, it's not just a random thing. Those very precisely lie on at exactly the same wavelengths. And then same thing right there, there was another doublet. And then even these, if you analyze properly with a good artist, should lie exactly at the same wavelengths. The gaps or lines lie at same wavelengths. And that's exciting because that gives us a piece of the puzzle here. It tells us that it's not just that they're seeing different types of spectrum, but those spectra are related. And very clearly, this is kind of where we get the rest of the puzzle. Um, if we view, and let's see. Um, yeah, we'll do it this way. If we, if we now consider that, um, if we understand at least what a thermal spectrum is, we're emitting light at all wavelengths, we can choose three random wavelengths of sample here, and they're all coming out of the star at the same time. So if that star is emitting more or less a continuous spectrum, any wavelength you sample will be present. I think I mentioned before that's not entirely true. Um, stars actually absorb a little bit of their own light as the light passes through their own atmosphere. But anyway, uh, that's a super important thing. But what ends up happening is specifically as the light passes through that cloud, and I'll just use three as reference, some of that light passes right on through. It's not affected whatsoever. So let's say this blue light, that blue photon of light, I'm gonna use that word, goes right on through and that guy observes it. So this guy here might have just observed one of those wavelengths that, that was present in his spectrum. Same thing with the red one. The red one might have no reason to slow down or stop, doesn't hang out for lunch, and it goes right on through and that guy observes it maybe right there. However, it just happened that this green light was a very precise wavelength of, again, we'll say 497 nanometers or something like that. And somehow or another along the way, it got absorbed, first of all, by one of the atoms in this cloud, and then it got spat out very shortly thereafter in a random direction. And if this is happening on the scale of, you know, 10 to the 20 times per second or something like that, we're getting just, it, it looks like there's a steady stream of these green photons coming out randomly from all directions because they're being absorbed and then just randomly spat out. Now, some of them will continue on their way. Some of them will continue on that way. Some will go on that way. Some will be spat out that way. Some will happen to go down and strike observer C here. So that happens only for that exact wavelength of light and not the other two. And if you choose any other random wavelength, for the most part, that light tends to just go right on through. Almost all wavelengths of light can pass through that cloud, except for a very specific couple. And that's why it's important that this star is originally emitting a continuous spectrum. Because the domain, if you think of it in mathematical terms, the domain of the sampling here needs to be continuous. You need to have a continuous range of values so that certain specific ones can select only those, if you will. So you take a continuous spectrum and one of those wavelengths 
gets absorbed and randomly spat out. Another one, let's say in the red part of the spectrum, same thing. It gets absorbed by just randomly by some of these atoms and spat out. And some of those get spat out towards him. And eventually, if there's a handful of these individual wavelengths that keep on getting absorbed and blocked, um, I almost think of it like kind of a... Um, um, you guys might be a generation beyond word munchers. Um, there used to be a game, and we'll, we'll, talk, we'll think about uh, number number munchers. There used to be a game where you had like a you know a five by five grid on the screen, and you were some little green monster. And this is when computer graphics were literally green and white, or green and you know black. Uh, but the, you have a five by five matrix, and at the top of the screen it says like eat all of the multiples of five. And so you have to go through there, and you leave the eights alone, you leave the sixteens alone, you leave the threes alone, but you come across a fifteen, and you got to eat it. And so in the end, most of the numbers that popped up on that grid remain. And that's what the absorption spectrum looks like, except those specific ones that it told you to eat are now gone, missing. And that's what those absorption lines indicate. So it's the, the word muncher's version of absorption spectra. Um, if, you are, if you were born even in the 1990s, this might be completely lost on you. I don't know, a generation gap maybe, but uh, um, anyway. This is kind of the result of that level. At the end of the level, this is what remains on the board, and you've eaten off all of those ones that, that, that it asked you to do. So, the result of that, too, if you look in your, like, your trash bag as you went around collecting them, now this didn't actually happen in the game, but if you had like a loot bag or something, using now modern terminology, you can look in your loot bag, I think I'm not a gamer person, so I might be using it wrong, and you're gonna see the result of basically this. You're gonna see all of those specific wavelengths of light that you collected, and no others. So this is the, 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 the opposite of it. And that's precisely what we see. And that's why, in fact, this observer here is going to see an emission spectrum. Because he's seen only those specific wavelengths that this gas cloud specifically wants to filter out and then spit out randomly. And by the way, that's why these gaps don't go all the way down to zero. Because many of those wavelengths will randomly be spat out in, in the direction that he'll eventually see. So Sometimes there are cases where a line will be very deeply pulled down, and that means that it was just absorbed by almost every, you know, atom or molecule in there. But even so, it's like you'll still see, you'll still see a little. Um, so, last two things here, and, and then I need to pause. What, can, what physical properties can each of these three observers determine? And for each, it's going to be different. So what things about the universe can each of these three guys determine, or girls, based on exactly the spectrum that they see? And this is kind of cool. Now, let's start with the easiest one. This guy here, now at, at, face, at face value or whatever, when he looks directly at that sun and, and shields his eyes or whatever, um, by measuring that spectrum there, he can immediately determine the temperature, or at least the surface temperature of that star. Now, if you look a little deeper, it turns out that actually there are going to be tiny little gaps in this, just like for our sun. And he'll actually be able to determine uh, specifically what the chemical elements are that are present on the surface of our sun. Um, and then that's where Cecilia, uh, Cecilia payne kapotchkins work comes in, that by identifying specific element, chemical elements that are expressed at the surface, you can determine what's going on below the surface. And it's just a revolutionary idea. Um, it gets into stellar, st stellar nucleosynthesis and exactly how all the elements that we now know are created, and also how all of the stars in the universe are related. So, um, so this person can figure out, first of all, the temperature of that star, and then if they're good enough, they can figure out what type of star it would be. Now, going over here, person B is going to actually be able to see two things. Number one, if they ignore those absorption lines, they can basically see the same thing that A does. So they can see the, the temperature of that star, and maybe with enough precision, possibly even what type of star it is. Because as long as enough of that original signal is there. Now, secondly, though, based on exactly where these emission lines, absor absorption lines occur at what wavelengths, they can compare that to a, 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 temp a template or a sample of many different elements, and specifically many ionizations of elements. And they can see exactly what elements are, are present within this gas cloud. Sorry, I got really excited there. Uh, within that gas cloud there. And so specifically they can see, because, sorry, the exact absorption lines are due entirely to what element or elements are in this cloud, what molecular, uh, uh, whatever 
thing they they have. <laughs> How, how they are combined in molecules, their molecular shape, I guess, and also uh, specifically what ionizations they are at too, like I like I've referenced. So they can determine quite a bit, but they can't necessarily determine the temperature of this cloud. They can determine the temperature of the background star, but based strictly just on where those line up, overlaying on the top of this, it's very difficult for them to really get a feel for how hot that cloud is. Now they have other means of doing so, and specifically we know that certain uh, emission lines don't don't occur until you reach certain uh, temperatures and clouds, and the H alpha line is one of them. Um, but we'll come back to that. So finally, though, observer C, this I think is one of the most interesting ones because they're viewing a cloud of gas that would otherwise be invisible to them, that just sitting by itself in the universe. It should be just close to absolute zero, sitting there not doing anything and just not even real. I mean, it might be giving off extremely long wavelength radio waves just because it has some very small non-zero temperature. But otherwise, this thing would otherwise be, be just invisible in the universe. And so this person, when, when, when we bring the star near enough to it, this otherwise seemingly invisible cloud starts to glow. And specifically based on what wavelengths it glows at, they know a couple things immediately. Number one, they know, hey, there is a certain chemical or various different elements in there. And they know that there is some source of heat that ca that's causing them to emit. Because unless there was some energy source that was providing the energy to, to, for them to at least absorb that energy and release it, if there was no energy source in the, in the first place, there would be no emission lines. So there is some sort of chemical makeup they can determine, and they, they can know it's at some temperature. Um, the, above like just the ambient temperature, because otherwise it wouldn't be glowing. But here's the cool thing, based on specifically what, um, and this, you can't do this in all cases, but in many cases, certain elements and certain way, uh, certain emission lines of different elements will, will glow in higher or lower percentage based on the temperature of that gas or that, or that yeah, that, that cloud of gas. And we do this all the time in astronomy. We have, we can see, observe, observe different emission lines from the same star and based on the relative proportions of them, we can say, hey, that star must be extremely hot because it's emitting mostly that emission line. Or, hey, that, that the temperature is probably about that because the relative proportion is lower than we'd expect for an extremely hot object. So they can actually determine the chemical composition and the temperature of this cloud. And so this is, we actually can like make a temperature map of the universe and an elemental map of the universe. Uh, and I, I just think there's a lot that we can learn that I didn't appreciate as an undergrad. So I'm trying to kind of, you know, throw that off on you guys so you guys now see this. So um, I, I need to take a break. All right.